All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Joseph Bufidel. I'll be uh, moderating today's uh, attorney's fees program. I want to thank you guys for joining us today via Zoom. Um, I know we are we, we can't meet in person, and we're sorry about that. But I think the Zoom webinar is probably the next best thing, if not, you know, better because we have a broader audience and a better reach. So thank you again for joining us. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to thank thank a few people. Um, first, I wanted to thank uh, Gary Takumori with the Remedy section at LACBA for co-hosting this event with us, which is the business law section of the California Lawyers Association. Also, a, a special thank you to uh, Fatima Jones at LACBA for hosting this webinar, for coordinating and orga organizing logistics in the production of this program. Without her, we wouldn't be able to do this, so thank you. Um, I've been told that you guys should have all received the written materials um, with the Zoom link. If not, just sh shoot me an email or if you have trouble accessing them and I can probably send them to you again via email. Um, also uh, for this program, uh, we encourage you to ask questions. You'll see, I believe at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a Q&A box. So you should be able to ask questions through the Q&A and then I'll filter them and ask the speakers um, the questions throughout the program or at the end, depending on how it goes. Um, so please do not use the chat box if you can, please use the Q&A because I'll be monitoring um, that chat, uh, the Q&A um, box. Okay, um, so our program will begin uh, with Professor Bussell discussing the American rule and the history of recovering attorney's fees in the Ninth Circuit, the Supreme Court's decision in Travelers, and through the Ninth Circuit decision in Penrod and Boss. Uh, and then we will turn to Judge Kaufman and Mr. Salvato, who will discuss the availability of attorney's fees under California law and the various post Penrod decisions to analyze the availability of attorney's fees in various cases, both ca California and bankruptcy, and then the procedural mechanisms and timing for bringing such motions. And then we'll of course talk throughout the program about the practical implications of these decisions on the practice. So without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Professor Bussell. Thank you, Joseph. Um, and um, thank you to uh, LACPA and the California Lawyers Association for uh, putting on this program. Uh, Joseph des deserves uh, most of the credit for putting together the, uh, the written materials, which I think are excellent, and refer to all the cases that we're going to talk about and more. And so uh, I would urge you, uh, if you're interested in following up on any of these issues, uh, to, to uh, keep a copy of that. Um, outline and you may want to use that for future reference if you ever have to deal with any of these issues. Um, so uh, I've been asked to take a few minutes at the beginning here and just kind of set the table for you know how we got to where we are in terms of uh, the current law and then uh, Judge Kaufman I think will take us from there into the you know the, the current state of the law and the some of the confusion that has developed uh, and then uh, uh, Greg will also be uh, piping in about some of the implications of, of all of this. So the starting place is the American rule on attorney's fees, which is idiosyncratic to the United States. Throughout most of the world in litigation, the prevailing party is entitled to recover its, its attorney's fees um, if it is uh, successful in, in litigation. Um, in, in the United States, we have this idiosyncratic rule that no, each party bears its own attorney's fees. Um, this is thought to increase uh, access to the, to the courts. It's also tied in, in some ways to, the, uh, to our uh, con contingent fee practices. Um, and so that's uh, you know, an important starting place, but it's only a starting place because the American rule is a default rule. That is, the parties are free to vary the American rule and shift attorney's fees by contract in most situations. And moreover, there have been a lot of legislative incursions into the American rule and statutes that provide for fee shifting. And so we're now in a kind of blended world where you know, we, we have this background rule of, of uh, each party bearing their own fees, but uh, with an awful lot of contractual and statutory uh, fee shifting going on. So uh, I think we're ready for the next slide. If, um, I, uh, Joseph is in charge of the slide, so uh, he'll have to keep up with me. So um, um, the, 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 um, 
history in the Ninth Circuit is that with respect to bankruptcy litigation, a distinction um, has been drawn between uh, bankruptcy litigation and other kinds of contract enforcement. Um, contract enforcement um, uh, is generally subject to fee shifting if there is a contractual provision providing for uh, fee shifting. Uh, but historically in the Ninth Circuit, um, the, the rule was that those contractual fee shifting arrangements, although they, they were enforceable in, st in state court, did not extend to bankruptcy litigation. This is the so-called uh, Fobian rule. And it was kind of unclear uh, the extent to which the Fobian rule was based on state law versus federal bankruptcy policy. Um, but uh, because there were some earlier cases pre-Fobian which said, well, the scope of fee shifting in contract litigation is generally controlled by section 1717 of the civil code. And that requires uh, that the litigation be uh, on a contract. And so there were cases that said, well, bankruptcy litigation is not litigation on a contract. The California case law tended to diverge from that and have a broad interpretation of what an on a contract uh, meant. And then Fobian came along and said, well, bankruptcy, no. And it was understood, I think, generally as a kind of a federal preemption or a kind of almost a kind of federal common law uh, rule. That was the prevailing state of the law while I was growing up in practice here. Uh, you couldn't do fee shifting in, in, in the bankruptcy context. Um, and then in 2006, maybe, or 2007, uh, the Supreme Court got a hold of a case called Travelers. And in Travelers, um, the uh, Supreme Court took a fresh look at Fobian and said, you know, um, the basic principle in bankruptcy is that unless there is a specific bankruptcy statute that disallows um, a, um, a claim, uh, that generally the party's rights are established by state law. This is sort of the Butner principle that everybody talks about in, in the bankruptcy context. And so the Ninth Circuit uh, had no business imposing any further limitation on the recovery of fees than the California courts would impose under Section 1717 of the Civil Code. And so there is no special bankruptcy overrule. The question should be governed by state law, right? And so Fobian is overruled expressly in 2007. So now the issue is, well, what does state law provide? And so um, there is uh, some uncertainty about that. At this time, um, I was involved with my uh, partner, Ken Clee, uh, in a pro bono case that uh, raised the issue of the hanging paragraph under chapter 13 of the bankruptcy code. We were representing a consumer uh, debtor. And the issue was, uh, 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 whether or not uh, if there was uh, a refinancing of negative equity associated with a trade-in vehicle, whether that was entitled to the special protections against strip, strip down of a lien uh, in favor of the uh, auto lenders. The auto lenders had lobbied in a special exception that protected so-called purchase money auto loans from being, the liens from being altered in bankruptcy. Um, and uh, the question was, well, to the extent that there was refinancing going along as well as the acquisition of a new automobile, whether that counted as purchase money or not. And this issue was being litigated all over the country. And uh, uh, we su succeeded in, in the Ninth Circuit in establishing that uh, no, uh, the hanging paragraph did not extend to the refinanced portion of the debt. As to that part of the debt, the lien could be altered by a chapter uh, 13 plan. This issue was uh, highly contested. There were lots and lots of attorney's fees associated with it. Um, when we completed this litigation, the, the auto lenders sought certiorari in the Supreme Court because there were many decisions from other jurisdictions that had come out the other way on this issue. And uh, uh, we ultimately successfully defended the Ninth Circuit's uh, 
judgment and the, and the cert was denied. And so at that point, I uh, went to Ken and said, you know, I know we took this in pro bono, but I think that if you put together principles of California law that allow for uh, reciprocal fee shifting with uh, the traveler's case, uh, you know, we have a claim here for attorney's fees. And so uh, he said, well, if you think so, go ahead and, you know, let, let go ahead and, and, and go for it. And so um, um, what I did was I put together, a, you know, a demand letter based on California Civil Code se Section 1717. Now, California law is different from the law of most states. It doesn't simply enforce contractual fee shifting. It also, by statute, makes the fee shifting um, reciprocal. And so uh, in the retail installment loan contract that the consumer had signed was a typical paragraph that said that the lender has the right to uh, get costs of collection, including reasonable attorney's fees, in collecting the debt. And so uh, uh, that was presumably an enforceable contractual fee shift under California law. If a lawsuit had been brought in California court for collection of the debt, they could have tacked on their attorney's fees. And uh, so uh, um, um, under 1717's reciprocity principle, because the bank could collect against Penrod, Penrod, if Penrod prevails in the, in the collection litigation, would have a right to attorney's fees against the, the lender. And so uh, we had clearly prevailed in the sense that we had defeated enforcement of the secured claim of the bank to the extent of the refinanced portion of the debt. That was what the dispute was about. And on that particular issue, there was no argument that we had not prevailed. And so my thought was, well, that means that under California state law, we should be entitled to the 1717 fee shift. And the Supreme Court has uh, gracefully uh, uh, removed the Fobian bar to collection of the fee. And so we should be able to recover the attorney's fee from the that we uh, from the lender. And so we brought this claim first in the bankruptcy court. We lost. We lost in the district court. And ultimately, we got up to the uh, Ninth Circuit and the and the panel uh, uh, in an opinion drafted by uh, or written by uh, Paul Watford uh, said, you know, uh, Penrod's right. Right. What happened here was the bank was seeking to enforce its contractual rights to a secured claim against uh, Penrod. Uh, Penrod had a federal defense to that uh, enforcement action that was embodied in its Chapter 13 plan. But Penrod prevailed. The bank, if it had prevailed, would have had a right to tack on its cost of collection uh, and there's no distinction anymore between bankruptcy litigation and uh, uh, state court litigation. And so uh, um, um, the fee should be uh, recoverable. Um, and so uh, that was good for us. It was good for uh, uh, Penrod. Uh, and you know, we thought we had made a significant uh, contribution to California law uh, at that point, and to bankruptcy litigation, by kind of leveling the field between debtors and creditors, um, and uh, empowering debtors who ultimately successfully prevail in establishing their uh, defenses to claims to recover the the costs of the of the of the litigation uh, from the creditors. Um, so, uh, the takeaways from Penrod are that you know. California Civil Code is broadly read on a contract means what it means under California state law. The California cases are generous in providing that uh, so long as the litigation involves a contract, it's not limited to breach of contract uh, litigation. It provides for reciprocity, 
reciprocity. If you are a prevailing party, even if you are not the party named in the contract as entitled to the attorney's fees, you have a right to collect them. And that right can be honored in, in the bankruptcy form and, and encompasses the litigation that takes place in, in the bankruptcy form to establish uh, uh, your rights. Um, it, it, although the statute talks about litigation to enforce a contract, the California courts have been very clear that the uh, uh, defendant's successful defense of the contract, rendering the contract not enforceable, does not vitiate the reciprocity principle. If the issue of enforcement is the issue being litigated and enforcement is not obtained, the successful defendant has a right under uh, 17. Uh, 17. In an interesting kind of way, um, this creates a kind of asymmetry between debtors and creditors that actually favors uh, creditors, uh, uh, favors debtors, because the fees that are part of the, the, uh, the, the, the successful claim of the creditor simply get tacked onto its claim, and they may be subject to discharge, and uh, to the extent that they're not secured, they may be entitled to simply pro rata distribution out of an insolvent bankruptcy estate and may be paid at a fraction on the dollar. On the other hand, if the debtor successfully defeats enforcement, you um, can collect hundreds of dollars generally uh, from the creditor. So um, felt pretty good following Penrod. The next case in the Ninth Circuit, though, um, um, represents some significant backsliding on this idea and creates another set of lines and has created, I think, uh, an interesting and difficult problem in trying to sort out what is the scope of this uh, right to collect reciprocal attorney's fees. It's also a 1717 case. It's this case boss that you see up on the screen. So what happens in boss is you have an employer who is defaulted in making his required contributions to a um, uh, retirement plan for his uh, employees. Um, and so the trustees of that retirement plan have a claim against the employer. The employer uh, goes into bankruptcy. Um, the claim is simply an unsecured debt. And so it's gonna be paid at in fractional uh, dollars in the bankruptcy of the employer. Um, the trustees seek to uh, uh, bring uh, non-dischargeability uh, litigation to establish that they can continue to chase the employer after the bankruptcy for this particular debt. And their argument is based on the provisions in the bankruptcy code that render non-dischargeable certain kinds of debts that um, are incurred in the course of acting as a fiduciary. And so the question that is litigated is, do those exceptions to the discharge um, apply in this case. And the employer actually succeeds in, this, in, in that litigation um, because the court ultimately determines that um, the employer is not the fiduciary, the, the trustees are fiduciaries, but the employer is simply an obligor in, the, in this context where it owes money into the plan and it's not the subject to, uh, it's not treated as a fiduciary under the ERISA uh, statute. And so on that basis, the claim is, uh, it's a just claim, but it's just an ordinary claim. It's not a non-dischargeable claim. And so now the employer who has already screwed his employees by not paying uh, into the retirement fund and has litigated with the retirement fund over this dischargeability issue uh, now makes a claim against the retirement fund for reimbursement of his attorney's fees, right? And so the Ninth Circuit, in a short opinion, after Penrod, reaffirms Penrod, but distinguishes Penrod and says, no, non-dischargeability litigation, that's different. That's not litigation on a contract, right? And so this is a very difficult decision to reconcile with the logic of Travelers and Penrod, right? Because uh, the distinction that, it, there is a distinction in California law between litigation on a contract and litigation that's not on a contract. But in Penrod, um, the court says, well, uh, Penrod's assertion of a valid 
uh, bankruptcy defense to enforcement of a contractual right, that is litigation on a contract within the meaning of 1717. And the Voss court nevertheless says, well, um, it's true that the debtor is interposing here a federal bankruptcy defense to his liability on this debt, right, that is otherwise subject to fee shifting, um, uh, the bankruptcy discharge. Um, um, and it's true that the debtor prevailed on that and established that, in fact, the debt was subject to the discharge. But that litigation didn't involve a contract because it wasn't about the contract. It was about what's the proper scope of the federal defense, the discharge defense, the scope of the, of the discharge and the scope of the exception to discharge that's applicable in this case. And so um, Penrod does not apply. No fee shifting here. Right. Um, the, the retirement fund doesn't have to reimburse the successful employer's uh, attorney's fees. So um, that sort of puts us in a place where we have now some very interesting, difficult, and theoretically, uh, I think, inconsistent lines of, uh, of cases to try and reconcile and apply in future litigation. And at that point, I just want to walk away from the scene and turn it over to Judge Kaufman to try and figure out how to reconcile all of this. So, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I also want to mention about how wonderful the written materials are. We're covering a lot of different statutes and a lot of different cases. And um, I think they just did an amazing job on the materials. And they're going to be very helpful if you ever need to deal with attorney's fees issues in bankruptcy cases. Uh, we're going to move on from section 1717 of the Civil Code to Code of Civil Procedure section 1021, <laughs> which is another opportunity to um, receive attorney's fees because uh, the right to attorney's fees is also based on, you know, contract. People can contract for rights of attorney's fees. Um, whether or not they've contracted to it, prevailing parties are entitled to costs. So um, the great thing, well, one of the things about section 1021 is it encompasses not only actions on a contract, but depending on this, on what the language in the contract is, it can cover um, things that aren't theoretically on the contract and also possibly tort litigation that involves the contract, if the language is broad enough. So under 1032 of the Code of Civil Procedure, um, there's a definition of who's the prevailing party, and you know that can matter because the prevailing party can recover fees under 1021 and also uh, costs. Um, and then we go to section 1033.5, and that talks about attorney's fees can be treated as costs, which a prevailing party is entitled to get when they're authorized by contract, statute, or law. So basically through your contract, the right to get costs as a prevailing party can encourage the right to get fees. Also, there's a chance you know, to collect your fees through statute under section 1033.5. So now we're gonna go on to a bankruptcy case where I was the presiding <laughs> judge and I published my opinion and the BAP affirmed that opinion in an unpublished decision. And then the Ninth Circuit recently affirmed in June. And it's an interesting case because a debtor in a non-dischargeability action who prevailed was able to recover his fees from the creditor who instituted the non-dischargeability litigation. So unlike Boz, which was based on 1717, in this case, which was based, the, the, the decision based on section 1021 was that the debtor could recover uh, his attorney's fees when he succeeded in demonstrating that there was not fraud with respect to the contract that was at issue. So Davis is a, a little bit, I mean, it's a complicated case because pre-petition, the, the litigation involved a real estate development project and the real estate development company and the subcontractor got into a dispute during the uh, build out and the, the real estate development company of which the debtor was a principal fired the subcontractor, uh, hired another subcontractor, refused to pay the balance owed to subcontractor, subcontractor went to state court and 
sought a breach of con for breach of contract, uh, fraud, and also alter ego uh, liability. And the state court divided the litigation into three phases for trial, the breach of contract phase, the alter ego phase, and the fraud phase. Um, because the subcontractor argued that if it had that the that the owner and alter egos of the owner had misled them about um, the contract and the situation with the development, and they wouldn't have entered into the contract if not for those misrepresentations or omissions. So before the debtor even filed his bankruptcy case, the state court had already completed the breach of contract action in which the subcontractor prevailed, also had completed the alter ego litigation in which it determined that the debtor was an alter ego of the owner developer of the real estate project. And the parties, the, the subcontractor had already collected all of their um, breach of contract damages and uh, made it had all this alter ego and their attorney's fees for the breach of contract phase and the alter ego phase. All that was left was the fraud phase. So debtor filed a bankruptcy case and the subcontractor then pursued uh, litigation in the bankruptcy case that the debtor should be denied his discharge and also for fraud, um, which they would have done in the state court. And they actually sought relief from stay to pursue the fraud case in the state court, which I granted, but for whatever reason, seven years after the filing of petition, state court had not gotten to the fraud phase. So I said, we'll just go ahead and do the 523 action in the bankruptcy court. And for that phase, I'll call the third phase, the debtor prevailed in showing there was no fraud, that he hadn't intentionally misrepresented anything about the development, that the subcontract hadn't relied on any representations about the development that were at issue, and that there was no fraud. And so debtor was the prevailing party in that, both in the 727 litigation, because I determined he shouldn't be denied a discharge, and also in the 523 litigation, because I determined that there was no, he hadn't committed fraud. So debtor filed a um, motion to get fees um, under 1717. Oh, and the other thing is debtor is not a party to the contract specifically. He, the parties to the subcontract were the subcontractor, uh, an unnamed contractor and the owner developer. Uh, the debtor was just a principal of the owner. But in state court, he'd been determined to be an alter ego and liable for the breach of contract damages. So we had to look at section 1717, section 1021, and determine if the debtor was entitled to his attorney's fees. And in 1717, and this is something that Professor Bustle has been talking about, we were dealing with very conflicting, <laughs> conflicting case law about, in a dischargeability context, when a contractor what do we do? Although it was a little bit different because the contractor already collected all of their breach of contract fees. Now they were just going for fraud. So we held that 1717 didn't apply because the enforceability of the subcontract was not an issue. Um, we didn't look at the validity of the subcontract. They'd already received breach of contract damages um, and that the dischargeability litigation for fraud was not on the contract under 1717. However, on 1021, we felt that the agreement discussed that actions um, arising out of the agreement, arising out of the contract, were subject to prevailing party fees, whether it was the owner developer's attorney's fees or the um, subcontractor's attorney's fees. And that the language in the contract was broad enough to encompass attorney's fees in the context of fraud in connection with the contract, which is what the subcontractor had argued. And that the debtor, as an alter ego, as determined by the state court, was entitled to his attorney's fees as a prevailing party, even though he wasn't a signatory to the contract and wasn't explicitly named as a beneficiary of the contract. And the focus of the subcontractor had been, well, even though we labeled him an alter ego in the state court litigation, he's not really a party and he shouldn't get his fees. And their other argument was, he's not a prevailing party because we won in state court. We won breach of contract damages and we won that he's an alter ego. 
But in looking at the definition of prevailing party, you can divide it up into phases. And the debtor was a prevailing party in the fraud phase. And as an alter ego, he was effectively a party to the subcontract. So he was covered by the contract and he was also um, a prevailing party in the dischargeability litigation. So he was able to collect his attorney's fees. And now as they've done appeals, he's collecting his attorney's fees as they go. Like he, he files a motion for his attorney's fees at each stage that he's won um, before me, before the BAP, before the, well, I'm sure there's one, I know there's ones coming for the ninth circuit and he's, he hasn't gotten, he hasn't received his attorney's fees yet, but they are posting, they are basically paying the fees into the court for us to hold until like they're, they're basically getting a stay pending appeal because they're, they're putting the fees up. So judge, how do you reconcile, you know, what's the appropriate scope of 1717 versus 1021? When, when do you decide which, which side of the ledger you're on? Well, of course, all of these involve, there has to be a contract, right? <laughs> it has to be a contract. So in any dischargeability litigation, if it's about something other than a contract, we're not going to be looking at 1717 or 1021, right? Um, I think, I mean, what I would, what we took from it was if it's, I mean, all we could take, we had to go boss forward. So we had to say, we weren't discussing enforceability of the agreement. We were just we weren't discussing enforceability of the agreement. We weren't discussing validity of the agreement. We were just focusing on whether there was fraud and that the subcontractor had already received their breach of contract damages. So, you know, that put us in a world where we were just looking, we could look at 1717. Plus, I mean, we had a reciprocal agreement, right? It was just that the debtor wasn't a, a named party. So we didn't need 1717 to get him to be treated as a prevailing party, right? Now, 1717 would have more play when you're not when you don't already have a reciprocal agreement. So for us, we already had a reciprocal agreement. It was just did the debtor, as an alter ego, get a benefit from that agreement? So that's the key. I mean, so the the, the key here is you you can go under 1717 if you don't have an attorney's fee provision in your favor on the reciprocity principle. Um, so if you need reciprocity, you have to go under 1717, but then you're stuck with making this uh, legal distinction between litigation on the contract and litigation that's not on the contract. And so uh, here you're not on the contract uh, because Boz says non-dischargeability litigation is not on the contract. So 1717 is not available to you so 1021, on the other hand, doesn't have the limitation of being on the contract. You can shift fees for torts or other statutory causes of action under 1021. But um, I guess my question is, is there, there, it, there is no reciprocity principle embedded in 1021, right? I mean, I, you know, the, the, the bat, well, we, we were dealing with it in the context of an alter ego where they were saying who wasn't specifically a party. So the ninth circuit in its ruling made it said, they're a party, you treat them like a party, you know, like, so it doesn't matter that they're not named. You already got an alter ego determination um, from the state court that creditor had collected, you know, the debtor was held liable for breach of contract. So we're going to treat them like a party. We weren't sure. And so there was kind of a suggestion that, well, maybe even if you're not a party in 1021, there should be some reciprocity, you know, like there is in 1717 under this case Reynolds, which this uh, California Supreme Court case, um, but we didn't need it for our decision. So I think outside of the alter ego context, I think it would be, would be I'm not sure you could get reci reciprocity in 1021 unless it was specifically in the contract. Well, let me let me ask this question, Professor Dan. Um, if the contract provides prevailing party gets attorney fees, what do you need reciprocity beyond that? You don't. I mean, in Penrod, we definitely needed it because Penrod said uh, the creditor can collect can uh, an attorney's fees when it's pursuing you know as part of its cost of collection, 
against you, Mrs. Penrod. It didn't give Penrod any reciprocal right at all, the contract itself. All right. The so, only basis for, for her attorney's fees was the reciprocal provisions of 1717. So I don't know that we would have had access to 1021, even though we had a contract and it provided for prevailing party attorney's fees in the event that, you know, or not prevailing party, it provided for costs of collection, which gets transmuted in, in 1717 world into a reciprocal right. But I'm not sure that it does in 1021, although in the Davis case, in the BAP decision, it seemed that the BAP seemed to think that it did. It seemed to import a reciprocity principle into 1021, which would lead me to the point of what do you ever need 1717 for? If you can get reciprocity under 1021 and you don't have the limitation of being on a contract, um, you know, that's a huge expansion of your uh, rights to fee shifting in California law based uh, litigation. Well, you know, the night, I mean, after my decision, there was a, an unpublished California Court of Appeals decision that held that somebody who was argue, argued to be an alter ego, but did not succeed. Like, I mean, well, they went on determining that there were not an alter ego. They tried to collect their fees under 1021. And the California Court of Appeals said, no, you don't, you don't get fees under 1021 as a alleged alter ego when that wasn't demonstrated. And I don't know if the BAP had the benefit of that decision, but the Ninth Circuit asked the parties to specifically address that unpublished Court of Appeals decision on 1021. So they ended up deciding, the Court of Appeal, the Ninth Circuit ended up deciding that um, in, in the context of Davis, where he was already labeled and determined to be an alter ego, he was a party. But there is California case law unpublished on 1021 not being reciprocal unless you're specifically a party. Right. I don't know. Did those cases make it into our written materials? I'm not sure that they did, Joseph. The High Sierra case and the MSY case? I don't believe they did. Yeah. So there, there are a couple of California Court of Appeal decisions that are have a bearing on this question of alter ego. But I, I agree with you. In your, in your case, uh, the Davis case, I think that what you can say is you had a reciprocal fee uh, provision in the contract, so you didn't need 1717. And the alter ego stands in the shoes of the party. And since the party had a right to attorney's fees, the alter ego has, has not only liability, but also the rights that, that uh, uh, of the party for who he's the alter ego. And so, I think that that can get you to your result. I think that's probably, that is what the Ninth Circuit did in affirming your case. Um, although in the, in the BAP decision, it seemed to me there was a suggestion, there was like a, an additional overlay that, well, maybe 1021 is reciprocal on anyway, and it doesn't matter. As long as the, if you had lost, you would have been liable as an alter ego for attorney's fees, then, um, as a prevailing party, you're entitled to collect them. I mean, you understand that the creditors collected like over a million dollars in attorney's fees and in the state court litigation. So, and then they, there they were, the creditor, arguing that debtor didn't get to have the benefit of his attorney's fees when he won. So there's always this backdrop, right, about what's going on in that particular case. And there was this sense of fairness, like you got a, a you know, a million dollars in attorney's fees. Now you brought a fraud action he wants to get his attorney's fees when he wins and you're now saying he doesn't get to. So, I mean, I think the BAP was kind of, yeah, that, that well, had some it, resonance with the BAP. I mean, there is this, I mean, the sauce for the goose, sauce for the gander thing is a powerful idea. And it's true that these cases, one way of reconciling these cases is to look at the kind of underlying equities. I mean, Marlene Penrod was a very sympathetic uh, litigant. She was this, Little, late, little old lady who just had a used car and was trying to do a chapter 13 plan. And she was prevailed at every level. And then she was dragged up to the Supreme Court of the United States to, to defend her chapter 13 plan. And the only way she was able to do it was by recruiting pro bono counsel to do it. And at the end, she, she prevailed at every level. And, she, and, she, and we were seeking attorney's fees that were actually much less than the lenders had expended in fighting with her. And um, the fee shift was very um, sympathetic in that context. 
In the Boss case, on the other hand, the employer who, who welches on his uh, uh, obligation to uh, his employees to fund the retirement plan, not only gets out of having to pay the retirement plan debt that he owes, because it's dischargeable, um, and it's only paid fractional dollars. But on top of all of that, he gets to milk the, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, retirement fund for his own attorney's fees. That seems like a very unsympathetic case for fee shifting. And in your case, the equities seem to favor the debtor. And it seems that the courts seem to be are being pushed, I think, uh, by, the, by the facts in some ways here. I mean, I otherwise, it's very difficult to get all these cases to line up should note um, that the High Sierra case actually is on page 17, but the uh, MSY case we didn't include, so I'll, I'll find the citation for that. All right, I'd like to talk about a case called In Re Matt Go Court, um, where the principles we've talked about are sort of pulled together. This was a lawsuit against First National Bank as a lender where the trustee sued under sections 547, 548, 549. And the district court, Judge Novak, held that the defense of that, where the bank was successful, gave rise to attorney fees under section 1021. Now, section 1021 we talked about is the broad attorney fee provision, California CCP, that may or may not be reciprocal, depending on how uh, you interpret the cases uh, uh, in Ray Davis and cases that follow. Um, the bank uh, was sued and they had a very broad attorney fee clause that I think is worth looking at. As we must, uh, we should always start with the attorney fee clause. And in this case, um, again, in Ray Matt Go on page 13. The attorney fee clause said the borrower shall pay the costs and expenses of enforcement of the loan agreement. Costs and expenses include lenders attorney fees and legal expenses, whether or not there's a lawsuit, including attorney fees and legal expenses for bankruptcy proceedings, including efforts to modify or vacate the automatic stay or injunction appeals, and any post-judgment collection services. So the attorney fee clause was very broad. This is a good guide, I think, if you're looking for a broad attorney fee clause. The question before the court was whether defending the lawsuits under 547, 548, and 549 uh, was enforcement of the loan agreement. And the court concluded that it was. The precise language, um, utilizing the note and loan agreement in order to retain the payments, the payments the trustee sought to recover, is the functional equivalent of relying on those documents to pursue a collection action. Both of those things should qualify as enforcement of the loan agreement and the note. So in In Re Matt Go, the district court awarded the successful bank its attorney's fees under section 1021. Now, this is interesting in light of the prior discussion because one might ask what would happen if the trustee had pursued, had won and pursued its attorney fees. Now, remember this is under section 1021, which if it's reciprocal, could have resulted in an award in favor of the, of the trustee. But 1021 doesn't have the reciprocal language that 1717 does. Clearly these actions were um, not strictly on a contract. The district court, however, says that utilizing the establishing a, a secured claim is constituted enforcement and that came within the terms of the broad attorney fee clause. Uh, let's go to the next one. I want to go and talk about a pre-travelers case in Ray Johnson and that's on page 17 of the materials. Now the Ninth Circuit in Ray Johnson said as a matter of law 
a attorney fees are not awarded uh, in a relief from state action where it what the enforceability of the contract was not at issue. Um, Don Johnson, the debtor, not that Don Johnson, um, defended and defeated the uh, attorney, the motion for uh, relief from stay to pursue a foreclosure of the deed of trust by the creditor Rigetti. The Ninth Circuit held this is not an action on the contract when Johnson won and uh, did not award attorney fees. The bankruptcy court awarded attorney fees. The district court reversed the Ninth Circuit upheld that reversal. Johnson is relevant, even though it's pre-travelers, um, for a reason that we'll discuss in a moment. But let me let me direct you to the Ritson case by the United States Supreme Court uh, on page 17 of the materials. Ritson does not strictly uh, involve an attorney fee provision. Ritson um, was a relief from stay motion where the creditor moved for relief from stay to pursue an action in a non-bankruptcy forum. The creditor lost. Justice Ginsburg said when the creditor appealed after the confirmation of the plan, um, the question came up about whether that appeal was timely. And Justice Ginsburg said, no, uh, the time to have appealed was 14 days after the denial of the relief from stay motion. And that's because a relief from stay action is a separate, final, immediately appealable uh, order within the bankruptcy. So it was not timely when the creditor waited until after the plan confirmation. Why is that significant or interesting? Well, because the statement that the relief from stay procedure is a separate discrete, discrete action within a bankruptcy um, kind of harkens back to the earlier uh, pre-travelers decision saying there are certain types of bankruptcy um, proceedings that do not give rise to attorney fees. And here the court is saying that that um, relief from stay is is separate. It's not in the nature of, of uh, uh, other bankruptcy litigation. The um, uh, case that followed and picked up on this concept in Ray Menko is on page 18 of our proceed of our uh, materials. In Menko, Judge Kronstadt, um, District Court, Central District of California, uh, post Penrod, uh, said that no attorney's fees would be awarded on a relief from stay action, relying on the Johnson case from 1985 in the Ninth Circuit. The relief from stay um, action um, was um, not, in the court's words, an action on the contract using the same terminology. It's something separate and uh, distinct within the bankruptcy proceeding. So Menko, Johnson, Ritson sort of form a concept that seems to be pushing back against the broad uh, language of travelers and almost sort of um, a, a counter travelers movement that seems to be a trend now where not all bankruptcy proceedings are necessarily uh, going to give rise to attorney fees for the prevailing party. It, you know, it's interesting, uh, Greg, because if you flip it, 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 it seems clear to me that under a, like the provision, that, the contractual provision that you read, if it wasn't the debtor seeking the fees, if it uh, was a reciprocal fee, but rather the creditor, wouldn't getting relief from stay to enforce your debt, wouldn't that be part of your cost of collection? And why wouldn't that be subject to the contractual provision allowing the creditor to, to tack that on? In, in, in the case of Mengo, it, see, it would seem that, uh, or Mengo, it would seem that the lender did get, um, or should have gotten, would have gotten attorney fees 
in a relief from state action based on that attorney fee clause in its loan documents. Right. Clearly was within. Well, you know, I mean, under 1021, I mean, lenders are adding on, right? I mean, if they win and I mean, if they get relief, if they, if they win or lose under relief from stay, they add the cost of that onto their claim, right? If, it, if they have a right to it. So it's really about seven, whether 1717 comes into play in but, these cases. But I mean, when the debtor could not recover under the contract, but, aside from reciprocity. But I mean, then it's, it should seem to me that, I mean, the sauce for the goose, sauce for the gander principle should apply. If the creditor can tack it on, um, then what you're saying is that that's part, he has a contractual right that is enforceable under 1717 as the prevailing party to, to, um, to the attorney's fees. On the other hand, if the debtor is successful and stops him from collecting, then it would seem that the, that the debtor would be entitled to the reciprocal provision. But only, that's only assuming that section 1021 is reciprocal. Or 17, I mean, all these loan documents have, have uh, uh, provisions in them that uh, allow for collection of attorney's fees. I mean, the lender. Well, I mean, it doesn't say the prevailing party. It says the lender will collect its attorney's fees. I understand. So the lender could tack it on. If the lender loses, why can't the debtor asserting 1717, if it's on the, I mean, isn't that on the contract? Well, that, that I guess is the next question. Is it permissible under 1717 as it was under 1021? It just seems to be very much in tension with, I mean, I understand the Supreme Court is treating the state litigation as a discrete piece of litigation and so that somehow that's separate and apart, but that's very artificial because it really is part of the same litigation. It's part of the creditor's effort to collect the debt that's owed to the creditor. It seems to me that trying to draw a line between when the contract is, is really an issue, and that's a very fuzzy line at present because reference to a contract would seem to trigger the clause. And um, yet in this case, in, in the case of uh, um, uh, Menko, um, it was not seen as an action on the contract because the contract wasn't discussed. It was, it was the uh, whether relief from stay should be granted as a as a bankruptcy principle, whether there was equity, whether there was um, cause. So um, I think it's blurry. It's not clear. It raises more questions than I think it answers at this point. I'm I'm questioning whether the. Uh, the, the trustee, if it had prevailed in Matco, would have gotten attorney's fees. And I'm not certain the court would have been so disposed. Under 1021, the court would have had to have found that 1021 is reciprocal. And then it would have had to find that um, defending, um, defending the fact that you're secured was an action on a contract or falls within the attorney fee provision. Oh, we we have one uh, question I thought was relevant before we, we move on to the next slide. And the comment was uh, under bankruptcy code 523D, a debtor can get fees for successfully defending a fraud action. The question is, is there any way to apply reciprocity so that a successful creditor in a fraud action can get attorney's fees? Well, the, the 523D right that's a pretty limited right. I mean, it's basically like a rule 11 kind of analysis under 523D. That if the, if the, if the creditor's claim is not substantially justified, then the debtor gets a fee shift in under 523D. And so, I mean, that's another way maybe of uh, reconciling boss with Penrod. I mean, I think that it's an interesting idea because you could say that 523D is, represents the federal policy with respect to the degree of fee shifting that should exist in non-dischargeability litigation, and it preempts contrary state law. And so all of this, here, there you have a specific statute that, um, you know, a bankruptcy statute that uh, speaks to this question of attorney's fees. And so that might get you out of travelers. 
And so one way for the, for the, and the courts have not done this, but one way for the courts to, to get to the boss result and get, uh, it would be to, uh, and to uh, exclude non-destructibility non litigation from fee shifting would be to say that 523D is the full extent of whatever the rights are for fee shifting. And it's very limited. It's only on a, on a bad faith basis, not merely prevailing party basis and um, get to the result that way. Um, in terms of the creditor's right, it seems to me that the creditor's right is based on his contract. And so he can, owe, so if he prevails in the non-dischargeability litigation and he has a contract that allows for costs of collection and attorney's fees, I think he should be able to tack it on. Well, I think fraud also doesn't, I mean, aren't it, I mean, hasn't there been, there's cases about how attorney's fees are part of your damages, right? For fraud, aren't there cases about? Yeah, you know? but, the, but, but 523D is about the yeah, discharge. Right. It's not right. about fraud, it's about, it's about the discharge. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know if that speaks to the question or not, but it, it, I think it's a really interesting observation that hasn't occurred to the courts that are litigating these non-dischargeability issues, but it's true. The code does speak to attorney's fees in the, in the non-dischargeability context in 523D. So you would use then 523 as perhaps a defense of not having to pay attorney's fees if it's not encompassed within yeah, 523. Maybe, because maybe it preempts, may, you know, I mean, I, I'm just I'm just reacting to the question. I hadn't thought of this before this moment. I think it's but, a good question. But but the but the question has provoked in my mind an idea of uh, you know there is obviously this resistance that some courts have to expanding fee shifting to include non-dischargeability litigation. Um, and so one way to get there is to say the exclusive remedy is 523D. Well, let me um, let me move on to some of the questions that we put down as discussion questions because I think they would give rise to some interesting comments. In, in, in connection with Matt Go, there wasn't a timing issue, but I could foreseeably, you could see a time when the proof of claim deadline passes and the conclusion of the litigation doesn't take place until quite a bit later. And so the question arises, should we be filing a proof of claim if we have a contract-based defense to a lawsuit by the trustee? A contingent proof of claim in the, uh, in the, in the bankruptcy case in case we prevail and then want to, uh, want to assert attorney's fees? Well, be careful. Do you want a jury or not? <laughs> Sometimes the defendant wants to assert a jury trial right, and so they withhold filing a proof of claim to avoid... Uh, waiver of the of the jury okay i would think that would be a risk in filing it but assuming uh um you but didn't maybe, want a jury maybe you were a bank and you didn't yeah. think a jury would be worthwhile or useful to you but most uh, of the time shouldn't it be in your original proof of claim that to the extent that you have a right to attorney's fees under your contract aren't you already asserting that as part of your original claim Ah, but if you've been paid off in a preference. Oh, okay. Well, fair or enough. Or if you're no longer, if you're not submitting a claim already, maybe you should be considering filing a proof of claim whenever you're sued. And it's not sufficient to rely on your ability after avoidance to file a claim because, but then it's too late because it, it, it's been avoided. If it hasn't been avoided, then you've you've lost the window to, to assert your attorney's fee claim because the bar date has intervened. It's it's a really interesting point. I mean, the answer is maybe. I mean, What's one part may be waiver of the jury, but if you really think that you uh, that that it's worthwhile to preserve a claim for attorney's fees, although that would be a pre-petition claim, it would be subject to discharge and it would probably be an unsecured claim, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, unless you have enough collateral to cover it, which I mean, and, and I think in Maco there was possibly they were oversecured, yeah. so. Yeah. It was it was ultimately determined they were fully secured. Yeah, so they were able to get their fees as part, you know, through their collateral theoretically, right? Or, you know, as a secured creditor. But if you were an unsecured creditor, you know, I mean, you're, it, I guess you're making your claim bigger, but it depends on how much is going to be in the estate, whether it's worth it or not. But to the extent, I mean, it's really interesting because, to, you know, to, to the extent the courts are uh, resisting the idea that statutory 
bankruptcy rights, litigation over statutory bankruptcy rights should be subject to the fee shift except to the extent provided in the bankruptcy code, that otherwise the American rule applies in bankruptcy litigation. I mean, you would think fraudulent transfer litigation, that's just a classic. I mean, you wouldn't say, oh, well, that, that certainly there shouldn't be fee shifting. Every, each party bears its own fees in the context of uh, avoidance, avoidance litigation. Um, you know, Except that would be the Macco, instinct. In Macco, they were sued on a fraudulent transfer theory. I understand. Yeah. yeah. And so, but I'm just saying that, so on the other hand, the logic of these cases and, and the reciprocal and the idea of reciprocal uh, fee shifting would suggest uh, that maybe, yes, all of this is debt collection and it's all on a contract and involves contractual rights, unless the debt for some reason is a non-contractual debt. You know, it's a tort claim or something. But almost all the claims in bankruptcy, there is a contract in the background there. And very frequently there will be at least unilateral and sometimes reciprocal fee shifting provided in that contract. And now all of a sudden have you completely broken away from the American rule, uh, rule. And is it now that whenever you get involved in litigation and bankruptcy, there's a risk if you lose getting tagged with attorney's fees. And what are the implications of that? Have we now basically moved to the English rule is the question. Well, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not sure. I mean, it, you know, some of this non-dischargeability litigation is garbage. I'm sure that some of the, the cases that come in front of Judge Kaufman, she feels, are the creditor in a high-handed way just trying to kind of bully the debtor into, you know, giving up part of its discharge. And, um, you know, uh, there's an incentive to do that under the American rule. If you are, by doing that, by bringing the action, uh, uh, if it's a weak action and you're likely to lose, you're exposing yourself now to maybe substantial attorney's fees. Um, and is that, that I would think would chill some of this non-dischargeability litigation, which may be a good thing, I don't know how people feel about it. So that. Judge Kaufman, do you anticipate more litigation as a result of these decisions or less litigation? Well, I mean, one of the reasons we publish Davis, I don't publish very often. <laughs> I write a lot, but I don't publish much. And one of the reasons we published Davis was it was a case in which a debtor was able to collect attorney's fees after being a prevailing party and non-dischargeability. And, you know, just so people understand, because that, that creditor had already collected a lot of money. I mean, it already collected breach of contract damages and pre-petition from one of the one of the principals of the owner developer who was solvent <laughs> effectively, who was able to post a bond. And, you know, it was like, why, like, why go after this debtor now? Who's, you know, I mean, they had their probably their own reasons, but I want people to know that that's a risk, right? In addition, in addition to the normal risk, which I would always tell clients about, which is, you know, what are you going to do to collect? Like, what's the point? Like, what are you trying to achieve, right? Um, and against an individual. So, I mean, I, I wanted people to understand that that was definitely that risk and to really think about, is it, in addition to whether or not you can collect at all, is it worth it when you may have to end up paying a debtor as a prevailing party if there's a, if there's a contract um, that would cover that? Uh, as, a practical matter, as a practical matter, you would all agree that the first step, the very first step is to look at the contract and the attorney fee clause. Right. And analyze the breadth and scope and applicability, even whether there is an attorney fee clause. That seems to be the number one step in, yeah, in any analysis. Absolutely. I mean, so, I mean, so, you know, this also has, I don't know if we're at this part of the program or not, where we're talking about kind of lessons learned and implications, but, you know, it does, it does, this has drafting implications for, for people in terms of what they want to put in their attorney's fee clauses, whether they want to have an attorney's fee clause, understanding the implications that even if you're putting in a, um, a one-way uh, attorney's fee clause, if it's governed by California law at least, it's very likely to give rise to reciprocal fees, et cetera, et cetera. So there, the scope of the attorney's fee clause, it's not just boilerplate that you should be you know, thoughtlessly cribbed from past agreements. I think you need to give some thought as to what the proper scope is and whether it's in your interest or the interest of your 
client to have an expansive or a limited attorney's fee clause. And that's going to have important implications down the line if you wind up in court and litigating these things. So Dan, how do I advise my client? Do I want a broad attorney fee clause in my contract or do I want to narrow? What do I have to think about to help my client make that decision? Or help me make that decision? It's this sort of one of the things that this is implicit in what Judge Kaufman was just saying and some things that you said earlier, which is, you know, the it's not exactly a level playing field here. From the creditor perspective, you're getting a claim. You're not getting the attorney's fees. You're getting a claim for attorney's fees against an insolvent estate that is probably going to be dischargeable. And so and if the price of that is opening yourself up to prevailing party attorney's fees, if you lose, you know, there are situations where you might say, you know, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to me. Also, in terms of scope, you have to understand this 1021 thing is very, very broad because of the absence of the limitation of on a contract. And so that opens up the possibility of, you know, and if it's reciprocal on top of it, who knows? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It doesn't seem to be on its face, but now you seem to have courts that are kind of finding a broader reciprocity principle in California law. You know, are you opening your client up to getting tagged with attorney's fee liability in non-contract litigation where there's a counterclaim for, you know, violation of statutory rights or tort claims that come back at you when you try and enforce your contract? So take on a case, Dan, where I didn't draft the attorney fee clause. It was already there in the contract my client gave me. And I realize there may be some risks. So I file my lawsuit, but I don't ask for attorney fees. I have it in my contract, but I don't request it. Does the other side have the ability to say I could have claimed attorney fees and then therefore when they prevail, they can get attorney fees? That's what we did. That was the defense that in Penrod that GM had. GM basically said, look, we didn't ask for, we didn't tack on attorney's fees when we calculated our claim. We were happy to get the whole, the claim vastly exceeded the present value of the car. We just want the car back. We're not asking for anything else. An unsecured claim in Marlene Penrod's case is worthless to us. And the Ninth Circuit said, and particularly Paul Watford was very strong on this, said, you know, the issue is not whether you are asking for attorney's fees or whether you waive those rights. It's whether you could have asserted attorney's fees under the terms of the contract. If so, then the contract is interpreted as essentially giving this reciprocal right under 1717. So conversely, if I have a contract without an attorney fee clause, but I file a lawsuit that asks for attorney fees, that shouldn't come back and bite me, right? That shouldn't hurt. Right? I don't know about that. If I don't have it under the contract, I wouldn't have gotten it anyway. I was just kidding. Yeah. I don't know about that. But anyway, it's, so I think that these very broad attorney's fee clauses that you see in a lot of agreements, like the one that you were reading from, which would have been kind of reflexively included, if we're really in a world where 1021 becomes reciprocal, and now all of a sudden, if the trustee comes after you for a fraudulent transfer or to avoid your lien on top of it, you're now maybe responsible if he's successful in avoiding your lien for his attorney's fees in doing so. I mean, that's a really, that's really changing the dynamic in a pretty dramatic way. I'm not sure the courts are going to go there. I mean, I think that this Matt Goh case may be a little bit idiosyncratic. I think that the instinct of a lot of judges, like it has been in the non-dischargeability area, has been to say somehow, no, that's different. I mean, it's sort of phobian coming back from the dead. It's phobian. Penrod is getting eaten away because there is, when people see the implications of this and start thinking, 
wait a minute, now all the avoiding power litigation, that's going to be subject to fee shifting too? Where did that come from? And you go back and you think, but well, this is rooted in travelers. Travelers was basically increasing creditor rights. It wasn't never, it was the furthest thing from the Supreme Court's mind that somehow travelers was going to empower debtors. It was about increasing the claim. It was about the scope of uh, you know, what are the, uh, the ability to disallow claims against the estate? And so I think that there's a little buyer's remorse uh, about, the, about Penrod and a, and a retrenchment or a pulling back in some of these areas. Um, and it's very difficult to reconcile analytically or theoretically, but um, I think that that's part of what's going on here. So the conclusion would be that we're moving closer to the English rule I think away from the American rule. I think so. I think we're, I think that Penrod and, and, and uh, this expansive view of 1021 are definitely indications of that. On the other hand, I, there is some, the, some of this countervailing of people who are, who are, who are saying, you know, when they look at the implications of that, particularly in cases where the facts are not supportive case like boss where you have a guy who really is basically wearing a black hat and now because of a technical defense that he's uh, allowed to interpose he get he not only gets off from paying the debt but he is now entitled to his attorney's fees as well i think that 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 there's a um, a reluctance there um, and so i think that's why there's so much disarray in these cases and why that gives a lot of opportunity to people here to, to a lot of, there's a lot to fight about in this area because these concepts I think are all being contested. You know, what is the proper scope of reciprocity? What is on a contract mean? Um, and, you know, uh, when, when is there, uh, uh, when do we uh, impose kind of policy limitations on the, on the fee shift? Judge Kaufman, are we going to see more attorney fee litigation or less? Are you seeing well, more? I'm seeing more. That's why if we, I mean, I have two more opinions that we're talking about if we go further in the program. But if we don't get to them, they're in the materials, which are all attorney's fee cases, because we're getting more attorney's fee litigation. Why don't uh, we just, talk about those? those, uh, yeah, those we, have a, we have about five minutes left. We apologize. If, if you want to talk to maybe about McLean or, or Gilman. Real quick. Oh, I mean, I mean, you know, I just, I just think there, these are cases. The next two cases are really, I'm um, in the context of judgment creditors. Uh, so you just understand that as a, as a judgment creditor, you have, so you already have a judgment against the debtor, and now you're trying to take various actions to collect by, you know, objecting to their discharge, getting the case dismissed, objecting to their claims of exemptions, under section of Code of Civil Procedure 685.040, that could be part of your, you know, you could be um, getting fee awards for that uh, through your judgment. If your judgment awarded you attorney's fees based on contract or statute. So once you have an attorney's fee provision in your judgment, you get attorney's fees through your judgment, you now have a right to attorney's fees for enforcing that judgment. If you don't have attorney's fees, awarded you in your judgment, then you don't have that right. <laughs> so it's very important to make sure that your judgment, if you get one, um, includes an attorney's fee provision. So in McLean, uh, what happened was the debtor, this is not published, um, the debtor had worked for a body shop. He left to go to another body shop. After he left, his employer found out like money's gone missing, what's happened, um, sued the debtor who was not yet a debtor. Uh, they agreed to a judgment, um, a stipulated judgment, and the debtor, um, that judgment did not include attorney's fees. Debtor filed a bankruptcy case because he couldn't afford to make the payments, and the creditor pursued a non-dischargeability action under 523A2, A4, and A6, and prevailed under A4 for embezzlement, for the debtor's embezzlement. Um, the judgment didn't award attorney's fees, so the creditor couldn't get attorney's fees under 685.040, and it wasn't, uh, we determined it wasn't available under uh, section um, 1717 either, 
because it wasn't uh, based on this settlement agreement and stipulated judgment because it wasn't an action on a contract. We didn't look at the validity of the settlement agreement. We didn't look at enforceability of the settlement agreement. This was about embezzlement that took place before entry into the settlement agreement. So, and then the other one was a case of a judgment creditor, Henry Gilman, and that is uh, the BAP published an opinion because that had to do with the time limit to seek attorney's fees once you have a judgment and you're doing judgment enforcement. There's a two year time period between um, that you have you know, two years from incurring the fees to file a motion to recover the fees. And in this case, the judgment creditors who did not have a very big judgment did a, engage in a lot of bankruptcy litigation, objecting to the homestead exemption, objecting to exemptions and retirement accounts, uh, filing an action for a denial of discharge. Um, all these things took a long time. <laughs> And because they didn't file their motion for fees in time, they didn't collect a, a, a lot of the fees on the, on the basis that their time period to file a motion seeking those fees had run. And so as a judgment creditor, even though they, you know, they had an award of fees in their judgment, which was based on statute, um, they lost their right to get those fees because they didn't file their motion soon enough as they took various actions in the bankruptcy case to enforce their judgment. So, but the thing is in this case, a judgment creditor, basically a lot of litigation, now bankruptcy litigation is now um, available for recovery of fees that you would add on to your claim or maybe obtain a non-dischargeability finding, which is what, I mean, these creditors were able to prevail in the debtors getting denied a discharge. Whether they'll collect is a different issue, but I mean, they have the opportunity to keep adding fees onto their claim, except for the ones that they didn't assert within the two-year period. I mean, just as a footnote, you know, if you're in in uh, federal court, at least the time limit is very, you know, in a, in a prejudgment uh, context, you have, uh, I think it's Rule Fifty Four. You have only fourteen days in order to make your claim for attorney's fees, so. Um, it's very easy to forfeit any right that you have by not making a timely filing on the, in the federal side. I'm not sure what the time limits are in state court other than the, the statutory time of the two year on cost of collection of the judgment. Actually, uh, certainly in federal court, it's real it, short. For California rules of court 3.1702, 60 days. 60 days? Yeah, the time, within the time period to file an appeal basically. So it's a little bit more generous, but you still have to you sleep on your rights. You're going to lose them in this area. So it's something you need to be aware of uh, that the time limit is very short. Now I've seen stipulations between the parties or applications to the judge to extend that time. Have you seen that judge Kaufman? Uh, yeah, we do. I mean, we get stipulations and also people who are, especially when it's on appeal uh, that ask before they have to pay up, they, they want to see what happens with the appeal. So, and, so it doesn't make sense to work up a, a full fee motion. Right. It, it might get reversed. Right. And are you are you able to extend that until the appeal or just well no sometimes you know, well like in Davis they're getting they're doing their post they're they're getting stays pending appeal for his ability to collect from them. So they're putting a lot of money into the you know for the court hold you know, they're basically paying it not to him, but they're putting it up with the court to hold on to it for them to have a stay pending appeal. So they don't have to pay the creditor, the subcontractor does not have to pay his fees while they've been litigating the appeals on whether he's entitled to fees. So, but there are other cases I have small or different cases with a lot less animosity or maybe just different. Um, and the people have not fought the concept of let's wait and see what happens with the appeal before I evaluate the fee requests. Would you have to have an agreement or could you do that sua sponte, just postpone the fee? Because um, I create work for yourself. I mean, I don't know. If somebody were to object, I don't know. I might have to say they would need to do a stay pending appeal. Usually they, like I have one where it's, it was relief from stay. I mean, I was determined that, well, it's bankruptcy code. Um, I determined they violated the automatic stay and I awarded fees to the debtor as sanctions and they're appealing that and we haven't made them pay it yet while it's on appeal. So, but that's in the, that's in the context of bankruptcy court, you know, a 
of a sanctions for violation of the stay. I haven't had it come up in other contexts yet. Well, um, I think that is our time. So I wanted to thank you all uh, for attending and of course thank the speakers, Professor Bustle, Mr. Salvato and Judge Coffin. Um, I think this was great. We probably could talk another hour at least, but um, this is our time. So um, thank you everyone and um, stay safe and have a good weekend and stay cool. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh.